Hello, everyone. My name is Barry Atkin, and I'm a volunteer with AARP Massachusetts. I served for six years on the AARP Massachusetts Executive Council and now continue to serve as the AARP representative on the first in the nation statewide LGBTQ plus aging commission that was established in Massachusetts in 2014. In Massachusetts and New England, we continue to make great strides to secure and protect the rights of all members of the LGBTQ community. With today's program, we honor the power of our stories and take time to reflect together about what has been accomplished over the past decades. We also look ahead to what work is still needed to preserve what is ours, the right to live our fullest and best lives. AARP believes everyone should age with dignity and respect and be supported to live how they want to live as they age. This event is being hosted by four states in the region as part of LGBTQ History Month. Some of you are from Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, and Massachusetts, and we welcome your participation and questions. I encourage you to check out the AARP resources and articles that are focused on the LGBT community, all available online at aarp.org forward slash pride. You'll find fascinating reading, including an article about an all LGBTQ mariachi band that is shattering stereotypes, and an interview with Jim Obergefell and how his journey as a caregiver led him to file the lawsuit in 2013 that would eventually make its way to the Supreme Court and make same-sex marriage the law of the land in 2015. Speaking of caregiving, please check out our planning guide for caregivers in the LGBTQ community at aarp.org forward slash prepare to care. It is part of AARP's vast reservoir of resources for caregivers, helping people navigate their caregiving journey. That's aarp.org forward slash prepare to care. To find out about the many other great events and offerings in all the states, go to aarp.org forward slash near you. Also check out aarp.org forward slash VCC. The VCC is for the AARP Virtual Community Center, where you can register for programs that are being offered across the country. And now I'm honored to introduce our host for today's special event, Mason Funk, who is the founder and executive director of the Outwards Archive. Mason was born in Los Angeles, graduated from Stanford University, and lived in Tacoma, Washington, Portland, Maine, and Lisbon, Portugal, before returning to Los Angeles, where he became an award-winning writer and producer of nonfiction television programs and documentary films. Mason's TV and film projects have covered topics ranging from Mother Teresa to the history of the White House secret recordings, to the long-term effects of concussions in professional football, to an American teenager's quest to keep her undocumented Guatemalan mother from being deported. He has received two Emmy nominations for his work in television. In 2016, Mason launched the Outwards Archive to capture the timeless, inspiring stories of LGBTQ pioneers and elders. Thank you for tuning in with us today. Over to you, Mason. Thank you so much, Barry, for that wonderful introduction. And um, for the audience today, welcome. I also wanna add one more note about, about Barry um, and her really important work there in, in New England and beyond. She served as executive producer of the critically acclaimed documentary, Gen Silent, about LGBT aging and caregiving. I urge you all to check that out. Um, again, my name is Mason Funk, and I'm the founder and executive producer at the Outwards Archive, which we commonly or typically call Outwards. 
um, Outwards, which is spelled O-U-T-W-O-R-D-S, um, is an archive of interviews with LGBTQ+, or as we oftentimes say, LGBTQIA2S+, elders across the United States. Over the six years of our existence, we've recorded about 250 interviews um, with LGBTQ plus elders in 36 states and Washington, D.C. Um, our very first trip six years ago, our first road trip, um, it brought us from Washington, D.C. all the way up to Portland, Maine. Um, and as Barry mentioned, I spent four years uh, in my 20s living in Portland, Maine, and they were incredibly important, pivotal years in my life, encompassing uh, my own coming out process. I had to get pretty far away from my native hometown of Los Angeles uh, in order to finally come out. Um, I still remember the very first gay bar I went to in Portland, Maine, the underground. I don't know if it still exists, um, but I have many fond deep memories and friendships from my days in the state of Maine. So I wanna give a little bit of a special shout out to the Mainers here, but to all New Englanders, um, your region holds a very special place in my heart. Uh, we are thrilled to be here as part of LGBT History Month. At Outwards, we frequently say history equals hope. We also say archiving equals activism. And we believe that capturing the stories of who, the people we call the greatest generation of the LGBTQ community is a great way to preserve our history, preserve our community against attempted rollbacks on the legal front as we're witnessing across the US right now. And perhaps most importantly, to empower the next generation of LGBTQ or queer uh, leaders and activists. They're gonna carve their own path. They're gonna figure out their own ways, thank goodness, of doing things. But we believe that knowing the people who paved the way for them, uh, the people who proverbially speaking on whose shoulders they stand can be tremendously empowering, inspiring and supportive um, as they engage in their own work. By the way, before I forget, we would love to encourage you to sign up for our newsletter and visit our archive. This is the primary way that we're able to share all of our stories completely free of charge with the general public, the outwardsarchive.org. Again, remember how to spell outwards, it's O-U-T-W-O-R-D-S. You can find so much information there. You can also follow us on Instagram, on TikTok, on Twitter, um, and on Facebook, of course. Without further ado, I would like to transition and introduce our first panelist for today. Um, and she is in the state of Maine. Her name is Bobby Keppel. Bobby Keppel was a social worker for nearly 30 years. Of all of her accomplishments within the bisexual community, Bobby is most proud of creating the Sexual and Affectional Orientation and Identity Scales, S-A-O-I-S, with Alan Hamilton a model she has used in workshops, classes, and seminars to demonstrate the variety of sexual identities. In 1991, Bobby co-founded the Unitarian Universalist Bisexual Network, which later merged into Interweave, the Unitarian Universalist Queer Organization. From 1999 to 2005, Bobby was a safer sex advisor for the Bisexual Health Project in Boston, Boston Massachusetts. She's enjoyed being an activist, writer, speaker, and all-purpose nuisance maker, even as COVID has kept her mostly at home over the past couple of years. Without further ado, let's watch a short video profile of Bobby. I came out as bi about 1975. When I came out, I was already married. My husband probably was the firmest feminist I met for many, many years. So as soon as I figured it out, naturally the first person I would tell would be my husband, who said, oh, well, what's that like for you? And I said, well, it's like coming home in my own body. And he said, that sounds wonderful. 
it worked for us, I have no idea what would have happened long term. In uh, 1980, while my husband was away at a summer conference, uh, I was saying uh, he seems to be having a stroke. We're taking him to a hospital. I did, found out by midnight that night that he had an inoperable brain tumor, and he died the next day. Suddenly, I was a single mom of two teenage children. I had no way of knowing how it would have been different if you know, he hadn't died and we had to work out other stuff. I mean, I was in a fairly intense relationship with another woman at the time, but I don't know that that would have undermined the marriage. It certainly wouldn't have undermined it in the way that a brain tumor did. It was, and I think it still sometimes is, really difficult to know where and how to be out as bi. And there isn't really a bi community in Maine. I know bi people in Maine. I know lots and lots of queer people in Maine. And it's been interesting to me that people who used to sort of give me the shun because I was by uh, have somehow discovered that that's not appropriate. Maybe there's more understanding now of the fluidity of sex and gender and orientation in a way that there wasn't before. Like everybody else, I keep aging. I'm sort of on the edge of the oldest people that are out and by, which works really well for me because I get to go in help people understand about what's different about being older and being bi. And a big piece of that, not surprisingly, is lack of community. It's not just that we lack community, it's also that we have to deal with other people who are not bi, but are our age mates and our activity mates. So, for instance, if I move into a retirement community, does that mean I have to stay in the closet about being bi? I'd like to live long enough to live in a society where being bi is just okay for old people like me. I'm 83, so I don't know how long I've got, but it would be nice to see that. In the six weeks, actually, I'll be 90. I was going to reference that. Uh, <laughs> that interview was shot more than six years ago, and you're on the verge of your 90th birthday. And I wanted to, first of all, again, say thank you and ask you, given that there's a bit of a time gap between those comments and today, have you seen, with regard to the community, the lack of community for yourself, for bi people in Maine and beyond, have you seen any changes for better or for worse? And I guess we're going to have to reference the pandemic, but what are your thoughts about how things have changed for better or for worse over the past six and a half years? Well, I think that uh, older folks can, most of them tend to be stuck in the binary, that is, that there are only two sexes and are less open uh, to the current information about sex and gender. Uh, the research resulting from the he Human Genome Project doesn't get to old folks the same degree it does to the young. <clears throat> so people my age are stuck back there when there are only two sexes and gender was had much clearer outlines. I see younger folks now more open and accepting and a lot more fluid. The fluidity is much more a, a more accurate map of the territory than we would have learned about earlier in our lives. Uh, I've known uh, a young person for 25 years, starting when they were age nine, and they're now 33. And in those 25 years, they went being cisgendered to straight, 
to cisgendered straight and questioning, to cisgendered and bi, to cisgendered and bi and questioning, to queer and to queer and trans, and now to queer and non-binary. Uh, I'm working hard on learning the right pronouns. You're doing amazing, Bobby. And just, just that little timeline of that one individual person's journey, I think is really a journey that is being replicated in many, many ways within our community. Um, and I think the borders and the boundaries are loosening. Um, and you have been part of that. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you for being so upfront and out front as an elder or encouraging people to explore the limits and the boundaries and, and let them go gray, let them disappear altogether when it's appropriate. Um, I'm gonna move on now to David Wilson uh, and introduce you all to David. Uh, David Wilson, a Boston native, uh, enjoyed a 30 year career with Verizon Communications, serving in a number of management positions across New England and New York. David then began a second 10 year career in real estate as Vice President for Facility and Property Management Services of Spalding and Sly Colliers. In 2001, David and his husband became one of the seven plaintiff couples in the Goodrich versus the Commonwealth of Massachusetts equal marriage lawsuit. David and Rob, after the successful conclusion of that lawsuit, David and Rob were married on May 17, 2004, the first day of legal same-sex marriages in Massachusetts. Following his retirement, David and Rob moved to Provincetown in 2015. They are the proud parents of five adult children, 12 great grandchildren, and three 12 grandchildren and three great grandchildren. And let's watch a short video profile of David taken from his outwards interview. My parents are from Washington, Pennsylvania. Which is a small mining town south of Pittsburgh. They uh, met in high school, decided uh, we need to get out of this little town, and the night they got married, they moved to Boston. My first 15 years were in public housing, and I think dad and mom both felt like they were doing the best that they could, but always somewhat embarrassed that they could never do better. My high school sweetheart and I basically went through the rest of high school and college together. We got married the next year. By the time I was 26, I had three children. At that point, uh, it was keep your head down, go to work every day, build a career that will allow you to take care of your family. It was about 15 years into my marriage. I began to uh, question uh, my sexuality and uh, in that exploration i really came to the decision that i'm gay my first conversation was with my former wife and the response immediately was how do we work together what can we do to work together to continue raising our family my next conversation was with my mother she had this one child she raised me to move along this path. I'm now married with three kids and I'm coming out as a gay man. And in her view, and she said it by the end of the first 20 minutes, you're gonna die. But she knew a little bit about HIV. And again, that was in her mind, a death sentence. So she, she scared me. And then we decided to you know, obviously bring my dad in he was very hopeful. He knew gay men in the Boston area that were part of his sort of crew of working people that were healthy, lived healthy lives. I remember dad saying to my mother, this, this is going to be okay. We need to support him. I joined that Gay Fathers of Greater Boston. There was another man in that group uh, by the name of Rob Compton. We decided, you know, let's have lunch and lunch led to dinner. And we had a commitment ceremony two years later. It felt like a wedding, but glad uh, gay and lesbian advocates and defenders was putting together a lawsuit. And they'd said, would you be interested? And we said, yes, 
we would. I came to my dad when we joined the lawsuit and said, Dad, we want to have the legal rights that come with marriage. His comment at the time was, do you have to go public? <laughs> Are you going to tell the whole world that you're gay? And I said, Dad, that kind of goes with it. <laughs> we can't be asking to get married without saying that we're a couple. So all he then wanted was to be part of the ceremony. And as we started down the aisle, I looked and my dad was down at the first pew. He had his left hand up in the air. And that was his symbol of, I'm with you. Thank you so much, David, for sharing such a beautiful and personal story of your journey, your coming out, your family's journey. Your journey is really the odyssey of a family. Um, and I wanted to just check in with you and welcome you and ask you, given the fact that that scene you just beautifully described in 2004 at your marriage um, was 18 years ago, I wonder how your family, um, as a community of people, as you're both immediate and extended, how that, how the story of you being an out and proud gay man and your family's journey around that has evolved briefly over the past 18 years? Uh, well, just after 2004, um, my dad passed away in 2009, but he had a chance to witness the election of Obama and we celebrated that together as the family did. And from there, uh, the family continued to grow. Uh, you mentioned that in 2004, we had 12 great grandchildren. Well, since then, we've added three great grandchildren. So we now have uh, quite, a, quite a family spread across uh, six states and three of my grandchildren are in three different colleges across the country. So I would say that's a lot of conversations about uh, their two papas, our marriage equality fight and where we are today and how proud and blessed I am to have the family that we do. But thank you. That's terrific. Thank you so much, David, and welcome again. Uh, I'm, I'd like, I have the honor actually now of introducing our third panelist uh, for this morning, John Kalaki from Vermont. John R. Kalaki currently serves in the Vermont House of Representatives. Previously, John was executive director of Flynn Center for the Performing Arts, program officer for arts and culture at San Francisco Foundation, executive director of Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, which if you know the Bay Area, that's a big organization, very important, and curator of performing arts for Walker Arts Center. John co-edited the Lambda Literary Award-winning anthology, Queer Crips, Disabled Gay Men and Their Stories. And John's latest book is entitled Because Art, Commentary, Critique and Conversation. John received his first, the first Bank Award, Sally Ordway Irvine Award in Artistic Vision, the William Dawson Award for Programming Excellence from the Association of Performing Arts Presenters, Dance USA's Ernie Award, the Fan Taylor Distinguished Service Award for Exemplary Service to the Field of Professional Presenting, and Vermont Art Council's Canonstein Award for Arts Advocacy. Let's watch this short video profile of John taken from his Outwards interview. My father and my grandfather sold cattle at the Chicago Stockyards, and it really was the only job that um, the Irish could get at that time um, in Chicago. It was very difficult for my father to have his first son be this sissy, this effeminate creature. I remember coming home from a school trip and we went to see the Alvin Ailey Dance Company. I came home and at dinner that night with my four siblings and my mother and father, my, I don't know, 10 year old self or something said, I know what I'm going to be now. And my mother said, okay, what's that? I'm going to be a modern dancer. Whatever was on that stage, I wanted it. I wanted to be that creature. 
uh, these beautiful people I saw on stage. I came into my body. I came into my being. In 1996, a tumor was find, found inside my spinal cord. I was told that I needed to have surgery and that I would uh, be in the hospital three or four days and with a sore neck for a month. I woke up completely quadriplegic, paralyzed from the neck down. Surgery had gone haywire. In this newly disabled body, you know, I, I learned to walk again. Um, it took three months. They had to stand me up for me to stand up because I don't really have sensation in my legs. But I thought, hmm, I think I can learn to stand up visually. And they're like, what are you talking about? I said, bring the mirror over. And they said, well, the mirror's backwards. And I said, oh, I know. I, as a young man, I was a dancer and we worked in the mirror all the time to try to make things better. And so if I hadn't been a dancer, I don't think I ever would have learned to stand up again. And the other part of it is I then moved to San Francisco, a lot of queer activism in the disability world as well. And out of that came a book that I co-edited um, co called Queer Crips, Disabled Gay Men and Their Stories. So I was able to build a whole different community for myself as well. I'm now focusing on homelessness in Vermont, spending a lot of time in that, with that community. And it's been a profound learning for me to work in service of those voices, those people. And what society wants to do is just bulldoze them away and hope they disappear. It's always been the most disenfranchised who have nothing to lose, who begin to fight. Thank you, John. I, that, that last comment is so on the money. You know, uh, the people who have the least to lose are the ones who finally just decide, well, what the heck? Can't get any worse than this. Let's just start fighting back. Um, thank you for being an advocate for the homeless community, for the homeless population, as you've been an advocate for the disabled queer community, um, and as you've been an advocate for the HIV AIDS community. And I wanted to touch base on that. We couldn't really fit that into the video, but you've also had a profound journey with HIV AIDS and you were part of helping the gay community to kind of come back into their body at the height of that crisis and ever since. I know it's a huge question, but can you just briefly describe your journey in that area? Well, I moved to New York in 1973 when I was 20 and uh, spent the next 14 years there. I was a dancer and then a marathon runner. and as my friends began to get sick. There was no one to help us. So we had to help each other. We had to clean our bodies. They had to hold our bodies as people died. They had to help people die. And it was uh, terrifying, but the body was essential and the body was so feared, right, at that time. And, you know, I, I talk at colleges and people can't believe the difference in, in really this generational divide here. The um, when I went to the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis, it was 1988, and I presented a lot of artists that were reclaiming the body again. And they, it was started at the culture war. So it was, you know, the Keith Herrings, the David Warnanoviches, the Bill T. Joneses, the um, Peter Hujars, the Marlon Riggs, um, the Derek Jarmans. And so I felt it was essential because these artists were really important. They were changing and going against these norms of the fear of body fluids and of the body itself. And there were a lot of firestorms. We could spend a whole hour talking about the culture wars of the 90s yeah. and the similar tactics today. Yeah, amazing. Thank you for calling out those names, John. Um, I really appreciate that and for your advocacy on behalf of the arts and body fluids and our bodies themselves. It reminds me in a way, it kind of brings us back to Bobby's comments at the beginning. You know, our bodies are seen as these kind of finite things and they're labeled as either good or bad. But within our bodies and within our lives, we contain so fluids. It's interesting you use that word. We are fluid as people. Um, and fluids, fluids and fluidity, um, not to dwell too hard on the metaphor, but they're nothing to be feared. Um, but of course, you had to come through a period of time when, when the fear and the rejection of the human body was so intense and so profound. 
So here we are all together, a beautiful assortment and panel of faces. And I wanna start off with a kind of an obvious question for our New England audience. Um, only one of you is officially a New England native, that's David, but, but Bobby reminded me that her family's been in New Hampshire for a good 240, 250 years. So she's an honorary native. And then John, you've made Vermont your, your home at the, you know, the last 14 years, kind of at the, at the latter part of your life and career. What observations might we make about queer activism in New England? I know it's a very broad question, but I've got a feeling you all have something to say about this unique region. I have a map on the wall in my office and I look up and New England is so small, geographically speaking, but with an outsized impact on the nation. What are some of your thoughts? Obviously, you've never driven across Maine from <laughs> bottom to top, or you would not say it's so small. There you go. <laughs> <clears throat> yes. Well, I, I think in the political realm, Mason, in, I was in San Francisco in 78 when Harvey Milk was assassinated, and he was one of the first out political figures. When I was in Minneapolis, Karen Clark was elected to the state legislature as a, as a lesbian and served uh, recent, until recently. Um, but in 1978, it seemed unimaginable that people could be out and be in an elected office. Today, there's over 1,000 out legislators across this country. And in this upcoming midterms election, there's a lot more people running as well. So that's a sea change that I think I could not have conceived as a young person. Uh, Mason, uh, you've talked about New England, and as I look across our states, uh, there's very little representation from the communities of color. So I'm just a proud face to represent Black men, Black gay men, and people of color across our communities, and also just be a voice because often uh, we get lost and uh, so whatever I can do to amplify our voices, uh, I certainly try to do. I agree, obviously, to any opportunity to, to speak, not represent everyone, but certainly represent my personal experiences. And hopefully that triggers uh, responses from others. So thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, hey, Mason, uh, recently I, I was at Champlain College teaching a human rights class on LGBTQ issues. And afterwards, one of the young students came up to me and said, um, was there any hope in our current era with the Supreme Court and stuff? And, you know, I, I said, well, you know, 50 years ago, we were, to, we were uh, titled Mentally Ill, the American Psychiatric Association. And we, we thought that was impossible. We lived through AIDS. We thought that was impossible. Um, and, you know, we won a lot in the last 20 years of our rights. Those rights are going to be taken away or challenged. And I think the long view, and I think that's what's important about Outwards, is that in these conversations of people that have lived through these changes, that there is hope because our queer community is resilient. And I'm just so honored to be here with my colleagues here. But I think that's an essential part that our resiliency will win the day. Well, when I look back, uh, when I moved to Maine in 1986, um, the only municipality where my rights as a queer person were uh, protected was, was Portland, the city of Portland. And somebody asked me why I didn't live in some other, you know, like one of the suburbs. And I said, well, because I'm not protected there. Um, that fortunately seems like ancient history. Uh, although I will say, I think in a lot of Maine, uh, there's a lot of prejudice about uh, against queer folks. Uh, and I don't know how much it influences uh, legislation. We, in the time that I've lived in Portland, uh, we've had city council members now. Uh, it started that they were queer, but they weren't out. 
uh, was not mentioned in the campaigns. And uh, after a while, uh, they were out and they still got elected to the city council, which is encouraging. And both of them that I'm thinking about uh, were mayors at one time or another. It was a, it was a rotating position in Portland. So I would say that's encouraging. What to me is extremely discouraging beside the Supreme Court um, is this whole move to take books out of the classroom and out of the libraries and uh, try to limit uh, the possibility of kids finding out about queer issues. And uh, well, <laughs> I was raised in a free speech kind of, uh, con family. So uh, that's very important to me also because we have lots of librarians in the family. But I think part of that is motivated by parents who are afraid that their children are going to know more about sex and gender than the parents do. And I think that's a, a really uh, strange sort of attitude, but I guess I don't find it so surprising anymore. I did want to mention that I do have two adult children and one of them is bi. Well, was labeled by who knows what they're using now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, um, it occurred to me, uh, your mention of your of being by and of your by child, um, and each one of your comments, it kind of dawned on me that each one of you brings an additional layer of identity uh, that has not always been widely accepted within the LGBT. You know, we kind of gloss over the B for one, the bisexual community has always had to fight harder for their inclusion within the LGBT community. David, as a person of color, you face discrimination within the community, undoubtedly. And then John, as a disabled person, as a disabled queer. Um, so, and this is one of our favorite themes at Outwards, is recognizing that, that we all have multiple layers of identity and that our community is not immune from being inclusive and on occasion perhaps far too often exclusive as well. And we and so you all as individuals represent some of those threads of needing to find visibility for your whole selves within our community. I wonder if my comments there prompts any, any memories or thoughts or stories uh, from you all. When I was putting together the book, Queer Crips, Disabled Gay Men and Their Stories, it really came because when I was in the rehab hospital, um, I went to my weekly therapist session there and the uh, therapist asked what was on my mind. And I said, well, could you tell me about the return of sexual function? And because I was quadriplegic at that point. And she said, well, I don't really know I'm not gay. And I was like, well, I didn't ask you if you're gay. I asked you about sexual function and you're in a rehab hospital. Um, so I realized there was stories that needed to be told for people like me and my husband in these situations. And so as I put the book together, um, all the gay presses turned it down because it wasn't buff boys and lipstick dykes. You know, it wasn't what was, um, and the disability presses turned it down because it wasn't happiness. It wasn't the inspiration porn of, we are well adjusted and we can roll out of our vans and we're happy. Um, but eventually we got it published and, you know, it won a Lind uh, Lambda Literary Award, because it told the real stories of gay men struggling with disability, with depression, about being horny, hiring hustlers, and a hustler arrives and, you know, you're in a wheelchair and they freak out. Um, and I, I just was so grateful that um, my colleagues were willing to share their stories in a truthful way. And that has resonated um, because the disability community is invisible in the queer community. I profess I was one of those people until I saw the documentary Crip Camp, which I highly yes. recommend. And I was like, oh my goodness, we are missing the boat here at Outward so badly because we have not done any outreach to the disabled community. 
Um, and I realized my own prejudices and biases were that queer people don't have sexuality. They effectively don't have bodies. Um, and so I had a long ways to go. Thank you, John, for your comments. Other thoughts from David or Bobby? Uh, Mason, I can just jump in and say, uh, I guess I expected when I moved to Provincetown that I could retire as an out gay man and probably not have to pay much attention to race, but uh, it kind of hit me square in the face. And uh, we're a microcosm of this country we live in and the world. Uh, we're pretty segregated in the way we live, socialize, go to church, uh, just about everything we do. So I found racism to be pretty rampant, but it's under the radar. So attending events, dinners, galas, uh, I find myself to always be in the minority and often the questions, the comments are offensive, but because I'm often alone or not feeling like I'm supported by the group I'm with, I tend to just go back to where I started, which is keep my head down mm -hmm. and try mm -hmm. to fit in. So I just wanna share and highlight that um, race, especially over the last five years, people are emboldened to basically say anything they want and expect me to um, sort of take it. So the microaggressions that I'm facing, I just want every one of us to think about, and I'm look, always looking for allies. If we're together, Mason, and I lose my voice because I'm angry at something that's said, I might look to you to help me out. And that's kind of the message to our audience today. If you have people of color in your life, please look to them, help them reach out, uh, be part of their life so that the the day-to-day -day struggles we can all do together. Thank you. Thank Amen. you. Amen. I'm yeah. sure I can speak for John and, and Bobby saying that we are happy to be your ally, your allies. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm thinking back to when I still lived in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, and I was out as as bi in the women's community. And the women's community there was very inclusive. It had straight and uh, lesbian and bi and who knows, all in, under one umbrella. And I started, uh, I was a practicing social work, clinical social worker. So I started having women come to talk to me and saying, well, uh, I came out, I left my marriage, I left my family to be in a relationship with another woman. And now that I've been, done that for several years, I realize I'm still sexually attracted to men as well and romantically. And I don't know what to do about that. And if I come out as bi, I'm going to be totally ostracized in the lesbian community, and I will have lost my family twice. <laughs> I didn't have any bright new answers for that, but I was really surprised uh, at that point by how important that was and how many people were being affected. Uh, the same has happened in Maine. I know a number of women who publicly identify as lesbians, but who have ongoing romantic relationships with men. It, they're keeping um, under far under the radar, but they've shared that with me. Yeah, yeah. And they and I've had several of them say to me, "I would never be as brave as you are." brave meaning that you actually stand up in public and talk about bisexuality. Thank you. I'm positive, Bobby, that it may be a slow incremental process, but you're giving courage in micro doses to people like those women and others 
to gradually claim their full space. They're, full, they're at the trueness of their authentic selves. Um, and I believe that when you continue to speak up and be open as a bi person, you're, 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 you're doing this. You're just creating a little bit more space for other people to step into that space with you. So thank you. So Thanks. part of my nuisance value is to go, to, well, before COVID was to go to meetings and professional <laughs> gatherings and all those kinds of things and uh, to speak up about and urge other social workers, particularly uh, to stand up and be counted and mention that bi people are there and recognize that. We have two questions from the audience that I wanna make space for right now. Um, both excellent questions. One is, um, uh, I guess directly to me as, as founder of Outwards, which is how do we find our interviewees? <laughs> how do we find people in general? Um, I just wanna say pretty much every way under the sun and going back to your comments about libraries, Bobby, um, thank goodness for the internet um, because, you know, thank, I don't think, I mean, I, it's sort of silly that people think that by banning books, they can stop the flow of information. I think they forgot there was this thing called the internet. Um, but that's one of the ways that we have found our interviewees dating back to the very beginning. Um, we also, I literally started off with an amazing history that I always like to quote. This was published in 2016, just as I was launching Outwards. It's called The Gay Revolution by amazing historian Lillian Fetterman, Baderman, and I recommend it highly. So I went through this book, and if I showed you, you can probably find my yellow highlighting. I read the book, I highlighted the names of everybody in the book, and I called up or I emailed Lillian and said, who's still alive? Who should we interview? That was another way. Um, I also happen to have, speaking of the Obama White House, David, your mention of the election, of Obama, I had a friend from Stanford who was part of Obama's LGBT team. Um, so needless to say, he met amazing people around the country. He became an amazing, uh, a terrific resource for names. Um, and lastly, word of mouth. I've probably forgotten one or two channels, but once we interview somebody and if that person has a good experience, they frequently say, you know, here's some other people whom you should interview. And we are always, always following those leads. Uh, in fact, just a couple of weeks ago, I took a trip in person to South Dakota, the southwest corner of South Dakota, which is where the Pine Ridge Reservation is. And we were specifically seeking stories of indigenous two-spirit people among the Oglala Sioux. Um, and there was very much a bridge building experience where you kind of need to show up and build some relationships. But the trip went well. We recorded five interviews with two-spirit um, individuals from that community. And now they're, they're saying, well, here's some other people, not just there, but beyond across the continent whom we should interview. So that's exciting for us. Thank you for that question. The other question is, what are, to the whole panel, what are your thoughts on aging equity in your community, um, specifically for LGBT people and others who may be excluded or erased within the aging community? What do you witness and what are your um, what are the ways in which you're, you're trying to build greater equity, um, if any? And I'll just put that out to the whole panel. Mm. Well, just a quick answer for me, Mason. Uh, Rob and I found a 55 plus community in Provincetown. Uh, we moved in two years ago. About 70% of the community in our two buildings is LGBT. We have activities, we invite in guests, uh, we do everything to celebrate who we are. And uh, obviously the straight residents are there because they support us and are welcoming. So I certainly would encourage uh, folks around the country and obviously across New England to look for communities as we age that uh, allow us to age in place. Uh, we not only have the residency, but Behind us, we have a wellness center. And behind that, we have a nursing home. And obviously, we can move beyond there. But we are now in place and can age from where we are uh, to the last chapter of our life. And that's very encouraging for, for, for at least for Rob and me. Yeah, that's wonderful. John and I'm Bobby, green you're... with envy. 
<laughs> Say more, Bobby. Well, some years ago, I considered whether or not I should move out of my apartment and into a retirement community. So I looked at the ones around, particularly the ones uh, that are fairly nearby and where I know a bunch of the residents. And uh, what I found was that uh, the one there was Ocean View is just across the water here from Portland in Falmouth. And the only people who were out there were lesbian couples. And uh, I was not able to discover that there were any gay men, not never mind bi folks. And I decided the only way I would be accepted there was if I went back in the closet, which uh, was unbelievable to me. I mean, I just couldn't compromise that way. So I looked at another one and uh, it was pretty much the same story. So I don't know of any retirement facility in the state of Maine where queer folks are welcomed. And I don't know, I, I know in Seattle there are people that are uh, setting up facilities from scratch. I haven't heard of any of that going on here. We've had some conversations. I'm a member of SAGE and up until pandemic hit, we were had monthly dinners and uh, there's been some discussion about it, but I have not seen any action. But you are reminding me, thank you, that there's a stay of, they just changed their name from Portland Area Villages to something independent to uh, help people stay in their homes. And that I need to talk with the director, whom I know, and say, uh, what are you doing about services for queer folks? Because it's it's all volunteers that are doing the work. Thanks. And, and this issue, you know, as as part of being a legislator, I visit a lot of senior homes to talk to constituents and hear their concerns. And I, I mean, I'm an out legislator, and that's never been a problem. But almost at every visit after I was done someone quietly would say to me on the way out, oh, by the way, I happen to be a lesbian or I am a gay person, but they are not out in their senior community. And it just- That's a terrible way to age. It breaks my heart. So I, yeah. I think, you know, David, what you're talking about is so important, but in less congregated situations with a cute, queer community gathers, it's, it's, it's really a daunting problem as, as we age. Mm -hmm. Well, thank, I'm, I'm so glad that, that, the, that the sponsor of this event is AARP, because if there's ever an organization, I don't mean to make it sound like it's easy, but if there's ever, ever an organization with the wherewithal and the resources to make a dent, um, I would imagine it's AARP. So I'm thrilled um, that they're listening and that you all are voicing this reality so clearly, the entire notion that someone would have to go back in the closet, because when you're at a certain age, your priorities shift, you want to make sure you're getting the best medical care possible, for example. But if you're not sure that your caregiver is going to be accepting and inclusive of you and celebrate you as a queer person, you might be tempted to hedge your bets a little bit. And as Bobby pointed out, that's a terrible way to age. It's an un, 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 unacceptable reality for aging LGBTQ people. We have like two minutes and it basically means that it's um, <laughs> time to wrap up. Um, I can't believe our time has gone by this fast. I hope the audience has um, enjoyed um, these comments. Please go to the outwardsarchive.org and sign up for our newsletter. Please also, if you have names of people whom you believe we should interview for the Outwards Archive, you can 
fill out a form on our website. You can also email us directly at info at theoutwardsarchive.org. Don't forget to spell outwards correctly with two O's. And again, I just want to say thank you so much from to Bobby and David and John for your moving and insightful and inspirational comments and your lives, your presence. Your presence alone are is moving, insightful, and inspirational. And I just want to say thank you. And last but not least, I want to say thank you to the different AARP chapters in New England who have created this event and brought all of us together uh, here today. Thank you. Without Mason. further ado, um, we will see you on the next opportunity. And once again, thank you for being here.